If you've been reading up on tuning Japanese planes, it's probable that you've come across the process of uradashi, or tapping out a Japanese plane blade. For a lot of people starting out, uradashi can seem to be a bit of a heart in mouth, almost uh, masochistic process uh, in Japanese plane tuning. However, there are very good reasons for it. It has very good benefits to the woodworker and with a bit of practice and a steady hand, it is quite an achievable process to undertake. I have uh, carried out uradashi on a number of our planes. The only time I've damaged a plane is when I had half a dozen people watching me do it. So if you want good results, just make sure no one's looking. If you're not familiar with uradashi, it relates directly to the properties and manufacture of Japanese plane blades. So we'll just recap a couple of those things here. Japanese plane blades are made with two steels. There is a hard high carbon steel right on the edge, which is laminated to a soft low carbon steel or sometimes iron backing material. At the workshop, uh, they are forged with a hard high carbon steel layer that is welded, forge welded on like so. This means that your cutting edge carries on all the way down the blade, usually to the point where you can see the decoration or the finish of the smith coming up. So we have this much high carbon steel to work with. High carbon steel has many properties, which is what makes Japanese plane blades so good. It can take a very good edge. However, to get it take a very good ed edge, it needs to be quite hard. As steel gets harder, it can also become more brittle. The soft steel behind it has a sort of complementary property that it is not very hard, it does not take a good edge, but it is ductile, it can deform without breaking, and therefore it is very strong. By laminating these two sorts of steels together, you can impart the virtues of one into the other. If, an, if Japanese plane blade was just a single high carbon steel, it'd be very hard to sharpen, but also very, very brittle and susceptible to breakage. Dropping it could shatter it. So having two steels is an integral part of the plane's character and managing those two steels is what uradashi is all about. So what is uradashi? Essentially, uradashi is the process of impacting the soft steel of the bevel with a hammer, driving it down, and then that soft steel can then push down the hard steel behind it. So what it means is that it gives us the opportunity to flatten the back of our blade, removing less material. In terms of the shape of an ura on the back of a Japanese plane blade, the holy grail is called an ito ura, which translates as wire ura. So if you can produce an ura on your plane blade that is the thickness of a wire the whole way around the perimeter, that is an indication of care and skill on your behalf. I'm not quite capable of producing a wire ura, an ito ura, but I'm getting closer. And the process of uradashi is one of the things that is really key to producing a high quality ura. When would one use uradashi? One instance is setting up a new plane blade. From the factory, a Japanese plane blade may or may not be close to flat around the ura. Often they are not, and this is a Yamamoto Teshin size 70 millimeter, and I have had the opportunity to see about 24 of these being set up in classes with us and Takami Kawai from Suikushi Carpentry. That process was really interesting because I got to see 24 students lap the back of their plane blades and almost all of them were diving off slightly in that right corner. Not all to the same degree, uh, but all followed a fairly similar pattern. We have, the we have the option when setting up this plane blade to work all of the high spots except for that corner to bring them down back into level with it, or we can use the uradashi process to drive that corner down and bring it back into level with the rest of our ura. So that's what I'll be doing today. Another plane blade that we have in the shop is a bit different in that both the corners of the, of the ura are touching the uh, lapping plate as we work it. However, the middle of that blade is not. So I'm going to use uradashi to drive that down and bring the middle into plane with the corners of uh, that plane blade. A very good opportunity to use uradashi is when you sharpen a blade to the degree that you have worn enough of the bevel away that you've taken away that front ura and you are back and your cutting edge begins to intersect with your hollow grind. When your cutting edge starts to intersect with your hollow grind, it is then time to carrot uradashi and you can then push that hollow grind back out, relap the back and you're away again. Finally, if you pick up a secondhand plane blade, uh, you will probably uh, need to do some work on the back. When you're buying secondhand Japanese tools, the size of the tool is considered, in sort of accepted wisdom, to be a really good indication of its quality. So this plane blade here has probably lost half of its size of the cutting edge over its lifetime. And the thinking is here is that if this plane blade has been sharpened that much to lose half of its size, it's been used a lot. And if it's been used a lot, it's because it was that carpenter's preferred tool. So, 
don't be afraid of buying a secondhand Japanese tool that's been well worn because it can mean that it's a very good tool. This one will need a lot of work on the back, but secondhand plant paints can be a very good opportunity to practice them. So how do we carry out Uridashi? It's uh, relatively simple, and I've already started on this, this plane blade previously. What we want to do is we want to give ourselves some information to follow. We want to draw a line on our bevel that is about a third of the way down from that back of the bevel. We want to be able to impact that hard, uh, sorry, we want to be able to impact the soft steel about a third of the way down the blade. Giving ourselves a line gives us something to aim at. Then we need to find some sort of anvil. We've used a few things as anvils. Uh, railway, railway line is highly prized and works very well. Um, we've previously ground down corners of our kanaban, our old kanaban, to form a little sort of softer area. If you have a, a soft steel that you can work and you can form into a sort of soft corner, that can work very well as an anvil. Um, or you can also use a very hard hardwood. And so I have this block here, which is what I've been using for a while. So we have our line on our bevel that we're going to be aiming at, and we have an anvil against which to rest our blade. We then need a hammer. With hammers, there are a number of choices. A lot of customers ask me about these, which are Kyushu Geno. They're called Kyushu Geno because they're quite common in Kyushu, and these Geno have that pointed end, which is generally used to sink nails. I've used this hammer for carrying out uridashi, and what I found is that this particular hammer has a very sharp bottom corner. And what that means is that it sort of digs in to the soft steel of my plane blade and excavates it a little bit. And I feel like I'm removing a lot of steel. I'm moving, I actually get steel chips when I have that really hard corner. If you want to use a, a hammer of this style, I recommend rounding that slightly, uh, but it might not be as effective for sinking nails. So that's uh, a personal preference. This is a regular Geno. It has one curved face and one fairly flat face. I'm going to be using the bottom side of that flat face. I find that this gives me enough control just by using the corner, by canting it slightly uh, and driving straight ahead. I can use that corner to get quite a precise hit. Uh, and this is a 375 gram hammer. I would suggest taking it very slowly and carefully. As I go, I'm going to spend a minute or two impacting the blade. And then once I'm I think that I might have done some work or moved it slightly, I will check on the kanaban. If that area moves and changes, I'll know that I'm making progress. If it doesn't, I'll go back to hitting. Uh, I highly recommend that repeated gentle taps is a great way to start and build muscle memory. If you find that after many gentle taps you aren't moving it, you can start to either move your hand down the hammer for more leverage or take a larger backswing, but you don't, you aren't aiming for a strike. You're aiming for a uh, focused pressure. You're looking to place the back of the blade on the anvil directly opposite where you're trying to strike. In trying to move this corner I am just working on the bevel directly opposite it and I want to come out at least as far as at least as far as here which is where I can start to see the corner start to fall off and I've come out, probably not quite far enough, so let's go a bit further. It's slightly smaller than it was. And I'm gonna just keep going. So between tapping sessions, I'm relapping on the kanaban to try and diagnose what's going on getting closer and to make sure that I'm not going too far I'm just going to keep lapping this for a minute or two because I'm tapping out this whole area I want to make sure that the areas around this low point aren't getting too high so I'm going to just polish it off on the kanaban and the polish will show me where exactly my high points are right now so there we go. The, the, because it's polished the whole way along this bevel, I can be fairly confident that I'm not creating any more low spots by driving this out too far. So I can keep carrying on with the uridashi. So it's really starting to come now. 
down to about a mil and a half, two mil. Because it's really moved in here quite a long way. For that last corner, still needs to come after five goes of Urodashi. And I'm just going to do another one and see where I get to. So there is just the tiniest little hairline of light on that edge. And I'm going to get that when I sharpen the bevel. So in this first blade, I have varied a lot in terms of where my hits have landed over on this extreme. That's about six millimeters, which is too wide. I've got a lot of variation there. I gave myself a lot of safety towards the back because I was just warming up. Over here on the right hand side, this is a better concentration of hits. A nice narrow line is what we want to achieve. And here I got a little bit impatient and started sneaking forward a bit too far on this side. We will see whether or not this bites us when we come to sharpen the bevel, but this is probably a little bit too far forward. I'd, I'd rather see this pattern here extend all the way to the end. So after reprofiling this bevel from a 22 degree bevel to a 25 degree bevel, I need to put in a new Ura. Having sharpened through to the hollow grind, my cutting edge can never be straight. It can never be properly polished and therefore it can't never be properly sharp. So Ura Dashi is going to give me back the sharpness and flatness of my blade. So I can see that my flats are currently finishing about here and about here, which means that I want to contact this area between them primarily. For this one, I'm going to use the rounded point of a Kyushu Geno, an old one, and see what happens. So after a first round of tapping, I'm going to check the back. So I've moved this in slightly on both sides, but we have a way to go to connect those two right here in the middle. I'm just going to concentrate my work here in this area. If I can get away with this light hammer and these, these, this pattern, I'm quite happy. The end of this hammer has been rounded quite a lot and I'm actually quite happy with the pattern that's, le that's leaving in the steel. It's after two rounds of striking and I have a microscopic aura formed there, but I want that aura to be a bit larger and I'm going to move back to the heavier hammer and see if that moves much more metal. We have two striking patterns. Now with a heavier pattern over the top from the larger genot, and we'll see what that's done. about a one millimeter wide or right at the front. Let's grow that a little bit. I just want this area here where my thumb is to move a little bit more. As a point of difference, I'm gonna use the heavier but pointier Kyushu Geno. That round got a little bit messy and these strikes are landing far too close to the high carbon steel. That is not good practice. So that plane blade is now usable again which is very nice. I'm now going to do a first sharpen on the bevel, just as an illustration of what's going on there. I previously set this blade's new bevel angle in this jig. So to show what can happen to these strokes straight off the, uh, off the Urodashi, I'm going to put it back in the jig and just run it over the diamond. So it's really interesting. Here on the sides where we didn't put in as much work, I'm already touching the diamond, but here in the middle where these stray strikes have dropped down further, I am not quite hitting the cutting edge on the diamond. So my bevel is now curved downwards, even though it's flat on the bottom. So I need to remove these two edges to bring them back in line with this bevel. And a big part of this is both the amount of work I put in here at the back, and also the fact that I dropped these stray strikes too far 
towards the high carbon steel. Not only can that damage the high carbon steel if you get it really wrong, but it can push it very, very far, very, very quickly, and you end up with a weirdly shaped bevel of the first sharpener. So after five minutes on the diamonds, I've now got this bevel nice and flat, dead flat, and I've also actually removed most of the marks from the Urudashi. So although they might be a bit unsightly for a little while, they will be gone within a couple of sharpenings. So after that little process, I now have two plane blades that are ready to use. So whether you are setting up a new Japanese plane blade or fixing up an old one, hopefully the process of Urudashi will be helpful to you in getting the best results out of them while removing the least material possible. So, may your hand be steady and may your auras be thin. Happy woodworking.